Good morning. Good Good to be back with you today. And if you have your Bible, I invite you to take it and turn with me to the scripture reading today, Matthew chapter 6. If you look there with me, we will spend a few minutes together seeing God's Word. Anybody ever do any public speaking? Let me see your hands. Anybody? Okay. It's uh, challenging. They say it's probably one of the most intimidating things in, in life. I, I don't know if that's true or false. Heard the story of a fellow that had uh, just graduated from seminary, going to his first church assignment. He had not uh, been a pastor. And so, uh, you know, he had opportunities to preach in seminary, have classes called homiletics. And so he was able to do that. And uh, this church had been without a pastor for some time. And so he was uh, told very first service as he walked through the doors, you're going to do a communion service. You're going to do a baptism. You're going to do your message. And you're going to lead singing. Well, needless to say, he was a little bit overwhelmed and not being, you know, uh, in, the, in the mode of, of uh, doing that on a regular basis. You know, he... He's, he finds himself on the scene and a little bit nervous, to say the least. And so he's getting up there, and uh, first thing on, on the agenda, he's thinking through, okay, we, we've got the baptism at the very beginning of the service. And so he's thinking through the communion meditation. He's thinking through his message. Uh, he's thinking through the baptismal formula. And, and a rather large person stepped into the baptistry. You have a baptistry right here, correct? And so that even made him more nervous because the water level raised up, you know, maybe four or five inches because this person was a rather large person. And so his mind is just sort of spinning with all that he has to do in this service. I've got to preach and I'm trying to think about my sermon outline. I've got to do communion. I've got to do baptism. I've got to lead songs. And so uh, he introduced the baptismal candidate. And uh, he said, now, my brother, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Dropped him down into the water. And as that man was in the water, and he said, and drink ye all of it. Well, needless to say, uh, uh, nerves can be a, a part of public speaking. Well, people worry about a lot of things. And, and I'm going to ask you a question this morning. Uh, what is it that you worry about? Think about it. What is it that perhaps has captured your mind even today as we are assembled here? We should be giving our attention certainly to the Lord, to His Word, but but something's sort of there in in your mind that's just not giving you a release. Some of us are worrying, and some of us, uh, you know, uh, it's perhaps more a question like this. What is it that we're not worrying about, right? I mean, that's how it is with so many people. Well, there's a lot of things, and it consumes a lot of uh, emotional reserve, emotional energy. Some people are worried about, well, what will life look like uh, 12 months from now or 12 weeks from now? Or what will life look like 12 days from now? Uh, We worry about health concerns. Some of you perhaps are in the throes of uh, some kind of treatment for some uh, uh, malady that you have as you think about home you look into the medicine cabinet it sort of resembles the back wall of the local pharmacy uh, we worry about a lot of things we worry about health we worry about all the dates we have on the calendar when we have to go get checked out for this and for that uh, health is certainly a concern and then beyond that we begin to worry about well well how am I going to have the wherewithal to pay for it right you get those beautiful co-pays, and sometimes, uh, well, this isn't covered because it's over here, and this isn't covered because it's over there, and, and then you're trying to figure out exactly how is it that I'm going to even uh, take care of the health care that I have that demands all these extras. Some people are concerned about money and mortgages. If you are younger, perhaps you've taken out a mortgage. If you've done it in the last few uh, days or weeks, uh, it's certainly more of a challenge than it was this time last year. There's no question. And then, you know, do I have enough money to to last through the month? Will I have uh, too much month at the end of the money? Anybody ever struggle with that? Most of us have had a moment or two in job security and Uh, career and employment, all those things enter into our mind when we think about things that seem to concern people. We watch the evening news and then 
Now, I would encourage you, if you watch the evening news, by all means, try to counterbalance that with some promises from God's Word. But you read the evening news or watch the evening news and you hear about terrorism and international conflict and there's all kinds of talk about nuclear this and that, pandemic, and just worry seems to swallow us. Worry is a stream, somebody said like this, worry is a stream of fear that trickles through the mind, and if encouraged and experienced, it cuts a channel into all other thoughts, and your emotional reserves are drained. Someone said these words, a day of worry is more exhausting than a week of work. Think about that for a minute. If you're really kind of worried about something, there's an element of truth to that. Now, now. Worry isn't um, a concern of somebody that's maybe uh, retirement age. It, it impacts us all. If you are uh, an elementary school uh, young person and you're transitioning up to junior high or middle school and you've maybe been in a single building with everything under one roof and all of a sudden you have to navigate you know, from building A to building C and this class will be over here at this time and where's my home room? And, you know, that's a bit worrisome for a young person. For graduating seniors, it's maybe a question of uh, what do I do next? What do I do in terms of school or field of study? Do I go into a trade school? Do I uh, get into a, a union apprenticeship? What is it that I'm going to do? Should I gain some kind of technical sc uh, skills or should I go to IT? I mean, there's all kinds of questions. Now, pastors and um, people that have studied the scriptures for life are not exempt from worry. There was a fellow who, who was an excellent linguist. He, he knew the Greek language. His name was R.C. Trench. And he, he was an archbishop of the Anglican Church and a scholar and a preacher in the 1800s. And he had this morbid fear of, of uh, somehow or another, one of his limbs, his arms or his legs, would become paralyzed. And so he had this habit of, of pinching himself to see if he still had sensitivity in his legs. One evening he was at a very distinguished, important dinner gathering. He was seated beside a woman of distinction, and all of a sudden she hears him mutter to himself, Oh no, it's happened. It's happened. Total insensitivity of my left leg. She spoke up and said, kind sir, it would be great comfort to you and to your mind for you to know that the leg that you're now presently pinching is not your own. <laughs> no one is exempt from this whole matter of worry. Someone said, I think it was Corey Ten Boom, some of you have read some of her writings. She was a survivor of the Holocaust. She said these words, worry is like sitting in a rocking chair. It'll give you something to do, but... It doesn't get you anywhere, and that's certainly true when you think about it. Worry looks into an unknown future and begins to imagine the very worst-case scenario, and as a consequence, uh, you end up with sleeplessness and, and stomach disorder and physical complications. One doctor said it like this. One physician said these words, uh, ulcers are not the result of what you're eating, but rather what is eating you. Sounds logical, does it not? Now, there's been research done on this whole matter of worry, and this uh, study perhaps is a little bit dated, but it's probably a fairly accurate reflection of reality. 40%, for example, 40% of the things that you and I worry about, think about this, never happen. 40% of what you and I worry about never, ever happen. Mark Twain, anybody familiar with that name? Listen to his words. He says, I'm an old man now, and I've had a great many troubles, most of which never, ever happened. Think about that. It's true. 30% of what people worry about are things in the past, and they cannot be changed. They cannot be altered. So why spend time there? 12% focus upon needless worries and concerns about health. 10% of what we uh, uh, find ourselves consumed by when it comes to worry centers upon uh, trivial incidental things. Only 8%, think about this, only 8% of what you and I typically allow our minds to be preoccupied with, what we worry about, are of a legitimate concern. 8%. Think about that for just a minute. Now, as we look to our text here this morning, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. 
And I've had opportunity to be at the very place where this was delivered by the Lord Jesus, northern part of, uh, of uh, Galilee, right along the edge of the Sea of Galilee, northern extremity. And it's a beautiful place where he shared this message, the Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's sort of like a, a natural amphitheater overlooking the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. And so that's the setting where he shares these words. And as we look here, he's talking about uh, life in so many different ways. For example, in chapter 5, he talks about if you're going to be a resident of the kingdom, you have to declare spiritual bankruptcy. In other words, you've got to see yourself as a sinner in need of a Savior. And that's why he says these words, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. We've got to declare spiritual bankruptcy before we can ever get a glimpse of the kingdom of God. Of course, Christ came to take care of that problem. We're fully aware of that. We can talk about that perhaps as the message continues. But as we look here, we, we find uh, this whole matter of worry. The Lord Jesus helps us very, very clearly here. And perhaps this is something, if you're struggling with worry, maybe uh, for the next week it would be a good exercise to, to read this passage each and every day to the point where maybe you'll get beyond what it is that seems to be consuming you. Now, notice with me, as we look at it, he talks about what not to do, and that is simply to worry. And then he tells us why we shouldn't do it. He gives us a lot of reasons. We'll look at those reasons here in just a moment. And then thirdly, he communicates to us here what it is that we should do. So what should we not do? He says, uh, King James, take no thought, do not be anxious, do not worry. Now it's interesting to note here, this word worry, it means to be drawn or pulled into different directions. To be divided, it depletes our energy, it, it keeps us from being at our very best. One biblical scholar sees this word meaning as to struggle. The natural tendency when life becomes uh, unpredictable is for you and I to check into Worry's 24-hour clinic instead of inviting the great physician to come for a house call in the times when we need him. So we find welcome words here uh, for weary worriers, and I trust it will be of help to you. Let's pray, and then we'll look into the text. Lord, uh, we know we are prone to worry, we're prone to wander, we're prone to allow our emotions sometimes to control us. But Lord, may the truth of your word set us free. You tell us that your word is true, and, and it's that which does indeed set us free. And so there might be one or two or three or four here today that's really struggling with worry. And, and I pray, oh God, that your word will indeed free them from, from that struggle and that they might have an absolute confidence in your loving care and control in their life, as well as the lives of all who are gathered here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What not to do. Take no thought. Do not be anxious. Don't worry. Now, I want you to notice here, three to four times in this very abbreviated small passage of Scripture, he repeats the same thing over and over and over again. For example, verse 25, you see it. You see a hint of it in verse 27. Which of you, by being anxious or worrying, can add a single cubit to your lifespan? Notice verse 31. Do not be anxious. Do not worry. Look at verse 34. Therefore, in light of these things, do not be anxious for tomorrow. Now, as a parent, if you're talking to your kids and you're trying to teach your kids something, and you say it not one time, not two times, not three times, but four times, the point is that you want to get the point across, right? Anytime you repeat yourself, that's exactly what you're trying to communicate. Anytime a parent, you know, again, repeats himself or herself, it's to drive a point home. And that's what the Lord here is doing for us. Don't worry. Don't be anxious. Don't take thought. And again, the Greek word means to divide, means to tear, to rip, to pull in opposite directions, to be pulled apart by our circumstances. And I have seen one or two people in my lifetime and in my ministry who are so overwhelmed by worry that worry has literally and emotionally and psychologically pulled that person apart to the point where they could no longer function. And that's the nature of worry. Anybody ever have a pet mouse? See your hands, anybody? One person. 
sort of like snakes, the only kind of good mouse, in my opinion, I'm probably not right, I hope there's no PETA people here, is, is a dead one? <laughs> just, that's just me, uh, you can differ, that's fine. But the average mouse, think about this, stays in a little cage if it's a pet mouse, and I, I'm glad you had a pet mouse, so. Uh, it will travel, get this, on that little wheel inside, that little metal wheel, 9,000 miles in its lifetime. Think about that. 9,000 miles in its lifetime, frantically running with no destination. Frantically fidgeting, fidgeting with no destination. That's what worry is. You can do it, but it won't get you anywhere, right? Corey Dim Boom, again, that Holocaust a survivor said these words, worry uh, never releases tomorrow of its problems. It merely empties today of its strength. Think about that. It's true, isn't it? You think about your own life and those moments where you found yourself sort of caught up in worry. So he says, don't worry because God is our Father. It's interesting. I just noticed that this morning, notice verse 26, yet your Father. That indicates what? That indicates a relationship. That indicates that He is your Father and you are His child and there's nothing I would not do for my children nor my grandchildren. How much more? Our Father in Heaven who is absolutely all-powerful, all-knowing. He is the unchanging God, but he is to each of us a father. Isn't that encouraging? And again, if you're not sure you're in the family of God, let me just encourage you to take a few moments and, and look at uh, John chapter 1, verse 12. It'll tell you how you become a child of God. It says, but as many as received him, Christ, he gives the right, the power, the authority to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Now he goes and begins to help us understand. I appreciate we're working the PowerPoint. That's good, right? There we go. Um, uh, secondly, what it is that we do and why, why we don't do it, why we shouldn't do it. Okay, notice with me, verse 25, he's saying, in terms of why we should not do it, worry is inconsistent. Let's look at it, picking it up in verse uh, 25. I say to you, uh, don't be anxious for your life as to what you're going to eat or what you shall drink or what for your body as to what you should put on. Now get this, he's arguing from the greater to the lesser here, okay, in terms of logic. Is not life more than food and the body more than raiment or clothing? What's he saying? Worry is really inconsistent when you think about it. He's saying if God has given you life and a body, and he has, he will provide those lesser things necessary to sustain life and body, okay? God has given us a life. He's provided for us a body to live out that life. If he's done that, he'll do the lesser in that he'll provide the food and the wherewithal, the sustenance to sustain life. In other words, if God's done the bigger thing, okay, if he's done the bigger thing, certainly he'll do the littler thing. That's in essence what he's saying. Now let me ask you this. Any man ever go out on a limb and, and buy your wife a gigantic diamond ring? Anybody? Anniversary, maybe 25th or 50th. Anybody? You guys are cheap. I'm just telling you. Just, <laughs> just think about this. Let's, let's imagine it's your 50th anniversary and God's been good to you and you say, you know, my wife always just had a, a gold band and I'm going to get her a diamond. I'm going to get her a, a Carrot diamond. So you go to uh, Trinity up our way. That guy's a believer. He treats people well, etc. Now, we don't have a lot of jewelry, by the way. I've, I've got a borrowed watch and a, a, a ring I paid $60 for about 50 years ago. But anyhow, um, you go to Trinity and you talk to Mark Helgeman and you say, Mr. Helgeman, I, I want to get a, an anniversary, a 50th anniversary ring for my wife. And so you dole out your children's inheritance, right? <laughs> That's kind of funny, isn't it? You dole out your children's inheritance or your grandchildren's inheritance, and, and you buy that beautiful ring, and you're getting ready to walk out the door. You turn to Mr. Helgeman and you say, Sir, um, would you mind if I had a small cardboard box bearing the name of your business or a bag to put this diamond in? What's Mr. Helgeman going to say? Hey, 
by all means. If, if, if the bigger has taken place, you can count on the fact that he's going to give you a, a bag or a little cardboard box. Uh, you're spending, again, your children's inheritance. What else could he do? So we need to understand this. Here's the idea. If God is the creator God, and he is, get this, he is also the sustainer God. He sustains us. The Bible says concerning Christ over in the book of Colossians chapter 1, by him, Christ, all things hold together. So, as we think about this thing, we understand that God is indeed the creator of God. And if he's done the greater thing in giving you life and breath, certainly he'll give you the little contingencies of life to sustain life and breath. So, when you think about worry in terms of logic, it's illogical. It's not consistent with rational thought. Secondly, it's, it's, it's irrational. Look at verse 26. He says, look to the birds of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather into your barns. And yet, I would underline this word. Do you mark in your Bibles? Most of you are using your phones and stuff now. You can't, I think you can mark it somehow. I just don't know how to do it on the phone. But anyhow, your heavenly father, I'd mark that word your heavenly father feeds them. And he goes on to say, are you not worth much more than they? Now, in the order of creation in terms of importance, it seems to be hinted at in Scripture that the sparrow is probably like on the lowest rung of the creative order in terms of value. For example, there's some Scripture that says something like this. You can buy two sparrows for a copper coin. You can buy five for two copper coins. Suggesting that you get one thrown in as a bonus because they're just so insignificant. They're on the lowest rung of the creative order. Sparrows by many are considered, again, the, the very least of the creation in, in God's economy. When I lived in Kansas City, uh, in a little town called Olathe, we had a, a grain elevator. And about this time of year, perhaps a little later in October, November, You'd see the big grain straight axle trucks coming out of the farms out of Spring Hill and destinations to the south coming to Olathe because there was a grain elevator there and they would transition uh, their grain into money. They would sell their grain. And so there was a, a place called the Harris Street Railroad uh, uh, Crossing. And as those trucks would come across there, uh, it would be a very uh, familiar sight for me. I, I kind of liked watching because it illustrated so beautifully this passage. Those trucks would come across here a little bit fast, maybe 10, 15 miles an hour, a little over speed, and they hit the, hit the rails there, and all of a sudden about, you know, two buckets full of grain would spill to the side. And then you'd see in about 15 minutes all kinds of little sparrows feeding off of that grain. That's what this is saying here. It says, look, the birds don't... So they don't plant gardens, they don't reap, they don't gather into barns, and, and yet your Father in heaven is very creative in how he feeds them. If God provides for the least of his creation, this is the idea, he's certainly going to provide for the pinnacle of his creation, namely people who bear his image, people like you and people like me. Now, when you think about birds, birds work, right? But they don't worry. I've never yet seen a bird perched on a, on a power line or on a limb, sort of like turning its head upward, expecting God to drop a worm in its mouth. Have you ever seen that? May I see your hand? I, I don't think so, right? They scratch. They peck. They're the next thing to perpetual motion you'll find, but listen, they work, but they don't worry. Jesus said, you know, a sparrow doesn't even fall to the ground without my taking note. In other words, the Lord uh, attends every funeral of every sparrow. They're insignificant in terms of the order of creation, yet God watches over them. How much more will he take care of you is the idea. So worry is illogical. Secondly, it's rational. 
Thirdly, it's ineffective. Notice with me, if you would, verse 27. And which of you, by worrying or being anxious, can add a single cubit to your lifespan? Now, um, this little phrase here, it's kind of hard to know exactly how to translate it. It might have the idea of of uh, adding to your stature in terms of your height, okay? Now, if worrying would somehow or another afford you the opportunity to grow 16, 18 inches, uh, you'd have some mighty good basketball players in Washington County here, right? I mean, if worry would be uh, the answer to growing in terms of uh, 6 to 12 to 18 inches. But uh, that's not the case. A lot of in CAA Division I scholarships would be handed out to a lot of young people down here. He's saying, listen, worry doesn't do that. Worry will not propel you to the next mile marker in the road of life. It cannot add to you this much of a distance in your life's journey by worrying, he's saying. Someone said like this, worry is the interest paid in advance on a debt that seldom ever comes. Think about that. Worry is the interest paid on, in advance on a debt that seldom or never comes. So it's ineffective. It doesn't work. It doesn't help what you think it's helping. You can worry yourself to life. No, I'm sorry. You can worry yourself to death, but you cannot worry yourself to life. Now notice he says it's illogical. Fourthly, let's look at it. Uh, picking it up in the verses here, uh, looking at uh, verse 28. Why are you so anxious about clothing? Observe the lilies of the field. They do not toil, they do not spin. Yet I say to you, Solomon in all his glory did not clothe himself like one of these. If God so arrays or clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not do much more for you, O oh, ye of little faith? Flowers are beautiful. I, I, I used to not really pay a whole lot of attention. I like the changing seasons, but we've got two beautiful mums in the front of our house, and they've just been brilliant in terms of their beauty this year. Probably the best ones we've ever uh, had, but I just noticed about a day or two ago they're starting to turn brown, right? Starting to fade. Up where the Lord shared this message, uh, they call them the sky. Scarlet poppies would be on the hillside blowing in the wind, and you'd see them in a certain time, and about this time of year, they would begin to fade as the fall advanced. So he's saying, listen, if he cares for the incidental flowers of the field, how much more is he going to care for you? They, they, with age, fade. We, with age, supposedly move in the direction of increasing in glory. They fade as in terms of their glory with the passing of time. But as you and I interact with the Spirit of God, the Word of God, and He begins to change us from one level to the next, that glory becomes even greater in us. And, of course, there's a day when you and I will be perfected in glory if you're in Christ. It says these words over in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. It says, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when He, Christ, appears, which He's coming again, when He appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Notice here also, fifthly, that, that worry is intrusive. Let's look at it, picking it up in verse 31. And do not be anxious, saying what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, what we're going to clothe ourselves. For all these things, the Gentiles, the heathen, that's the idea, people that do not know God, eagerly seek, but you have a Heavenly Father who knows whatever it is that you have need of. Right? That's what he's saying. Worry doesn't merely knock at the door. It leans on the doorbell, doesn't it? Uh, do, do, you're thinking, well, do you ever worry? Can you keep a secret? I can too. <laughs> 
Of course, I'm human just as you are. Having raised three kids, 11 grandchildren, uh, you know, uh, I think I mentioned in prayer meeting the other night, my little grandson, he's two and a half years old, got stung 15 times by a yellow jacket's nest, just up and just covered him, and we're over there racing, trying to pull these things off of him, get them off of him, and, you know, yeah, you worry. It's like, okay, Lord, we just come into your care. What should we do? Let us know what we should do next. We, we're looking to you for insight and wisdom on to handle this situation. So, worry is a small town I pass through, not a place where I hang my hat or sink my roots. Now, when you think about the Gentiles, the people in our Lord's day that were worshiping false gods, they had reasons to be worried because their gods were mean and capricious and vindictive and angry and as sinful as, sin, as, as uh, the worst of human beings. And so, worry was very natural because their gods could not be trusted, okay? The Gentile gods cannot be trusted. But your heavenly fathers of a different kind. He's all knowing. He's all loving. He's always present. And he's a father to those that are his. He knows our every move. He's attentive to everything we encounter. Even the hairs on our head as they drop from our head. Um, you know, he counts them, right? For some of you, it's not a real big challenge, but, you know, I, I'm getting thinner as well. But I told somebody the other day, you said, well, your, your hair's, you're kind of thin on top. I said, it's better to turn gray than to turn loose, you know. So, uh, yeah, the Lord knows those things. And, and as we look here and we think about earthly fathers with their imperfections and limitations, if they typically set in to, to, to care for their children as as any of us would, take it up a few notches, how much more your Father in heaven to those who know him and love him. So, what not to do? You are not to worry. Why? Because it's inconsistent, it's irrational, it's ineffective, it's illogical, and indeed it's intrusive into your life. So, what is it that we are to do? Look at it, verse 33. But, sort of a contrast here, but... Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things, all the contingencies of life, all the things that you need to sustain life will be added to you. That's the pursuit. Seek ye first. <clears throat> a number of years ago, I went to a, to a funeral home. And I knew, I used to play football with this boy that was in the casket. He was about three years younger than me. And uh, he died uh, tragically in a car accident, probably under the influence of something. And one of his family members, I think out of desperation, put a Jesus first pin on his lapel. And so as I walked up to the casket, it was like, There didn't seem to be much of a correspondence. Hey, listen, we're to seek first the kingdom of God. And if it were your viewing, for example, and somebody would to place a Jesus first pin on your lapel as you're there in the casket, would they say, yeah, that's a reflection of who that person is? He was a kingdom seeker. He was a difference maker in his life. He was seeking the eternal and not so much the temporal. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Make that your priority. Make the realm of God's rule your priority throughout your earthly sojourn. Focus on the eternal, God's kingdom, God's people, His work in the world. And as you take care of the eternal, listen, He'll take care of the temporal. That's what He's saying. That's a promise that He makes here. What does worry do? It certainly doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrows. It just empties today of its strength. It does not escape the difficulty. It merely renders us unfit to cope with it. Now look at your handout here. It best, I think, explains for us verse 34. <clears throat> Notice what it says there. Therefore, uh, do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Look at these notes we provided for you. Perhaps we can kick it up real quick. 
It says these words, leave tomorrow alone. When the day dawns, God will give you the strength and the grace you'll need for it. And then some scriptural promises to sort of re- reaffirm that, to reinsure that. Notice with me Psalm 50, verse 15. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will glorify me. Psalm 50, verse 15. Notice the next one. Cast your burden upon the Lord. He will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Psalm 55, verse 22. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, what does it say concerning tomorrow? Casting all your cares. What does all mean? All means all. That's all all means, right? Casting all your cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. He's a loving father with unlimited resources. He is also the God of tomorrow. Just as he's been the God of today, he will not let you down. He's got your back. And then lastly, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Don't worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind. That's where you have the problem, the mind. Will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Listen, if our hearts are where his heart is, He will take care of our needs. Would you bow with me as we pray? Well, this passage brings, I think, a lot of comfort. And a lot of things that we worry about, we really shouldn't be worrying about, most of which never come to pass, even as as we've experienced it. You see, this is an invitation. Think about this real quick as we close here. This is an invitation to rest in the arms of our loving Father. Typically, our first response, friend, is, you know, how am I going to deal with this? Perhaps our first response should be something like this. How will God demonstrate His love, power, and provision in this situation? Rather than worrying, one more time, we need to realize and perhaps ask this question, how is it that God is going to demonstrate His power, His provision, and His love in this situation. He says, I will supply all your needs according to the standard of my riches and glory. Tells me He has your back. Hey, listen, if He can take care of our eternal needs, you can be assured He's going to take care of your temporal needs. Lord, we thank you today for your word. We thank you, Father, for uh, the encouragement. We we really don't have to worry. So, Lord, just thank you for being our loving Father and uh, meeting our needs. Lord, as we look over our shoulders and what you've done in the past few months and few weeks or perhaps a few years, it's just a reminder of your goodness to us. You're too good to be unkind. You're, you're, You're too knowledgeable to ever make a mistake, and we take great comfort in that today. Now, friend, if you're here this morning with our heads bowed and eyes closed, you're not sure you're a child of God. Just coming to church is is not what makes you a Christian. It's not that which makes you a believer. It's humbly right before the Lord, right where you're seated, acknowledging your need of a Savior. You see, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. God demonstrated His love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the Bible goes on to say these words, If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Whoever, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You see, he loves you. He gave his son for you. We believe and then we live. It's that, that simple, friend. And Right there where you're seated, you can make that your heart's prayer. Just make this your heart's prayer. If you're not sure you're right with God, you're not sure you're a child of God, just make this your heart's prayer right now. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you to be the Son of God. And yes, I believe that you died for my sins 2,000 years ago. I believe that you love me. And I believe that you arose from the dead. And right now, dear Lord Jesus, as best I know how, I'm placing my full 
in complete faith and trust in your son for dying for me. Friend, if, if you've made that your heart's prayer today, going back to John 1.12, it says, if you've received him, he gives you the right to become children of God, even to those that believe in his name. Again, Lord, we thank you for the words here. Uh, free us, Lord, from this ever-present uh, temptation to find ourselves uh, worrisome. May we trust you, uh, casting all of our care upon you, because indeed you do care for us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.